I remember when my grandmother died, my mother spoke of the stop. She said, why hasn't the world stopped? Don't they know? My mother died. And all of these years on, as if passing the baton of comprehension of the great circle of life, I stand in the aftermath of my mother's death, and I follow in her footsteps, and repeat her words of stop. However, alas, the world keeps going, and it's all a blur. I first came to anthropology from a foundation of appreciating that there was more than one way of seeing the world. To see past the dominance of a neoliberal globalized world of chasing someone else's dreams of the dollar, capital D for dollar, I was introduced to the power of ethnography. In a world that moved so fast and where disposable culture evidenced a center periphery model, where people, places, things were sacrificed for another's profit, capital P for profit, I saw the invaluable significance to sense make the senseless, to observe, to distill time with a thick description of a contingent now bearing traces of the collapse of capitalism. Following in the footsteps of our Karl Marx, it is experienced that it is our senses alone that may determine the observable. Everything else is abstraction. For meaning making is made, made as imagined vistas of the virtual. Words were to be held with caution. For when words, when we use words, people take our word for it and forget to experience it themselves. However, a practice of sense making and making sense reconfigures empirical knowledge as a postmodern, post human vital materialism. And as my own cyborg manifestation, the camera allowed me to see, the microphone allowed me to hear, and thus my sense making came to be of practice led research. My first ever anthropological inquiry was about hitchhikers in Central Europe. Studying digital anthropology, my return to Europe transposed to nostalgia for my first time living in the global north. I used to hitchhike a lot, a leather tram, and amongst the big craze of a new share economy, filled with reputation banks, peer-to-peer -peer ratings, clicks and comments, and a big Facebook thumbs up, I asked a question of how a phenomena defined by non-monetary gift exchange offered an alternative to capitalism in a post-internet age. Like a Bolstorff coming of age in a second life, I was coming of age in both worlds of actual and virtual, assessed on their own terms a digital ethnography of multiple field sites, and those borderless ones the 10 hitchhikers whom I observed via participation. They cross-pollinated the channels of couch surfing, trust routes, hitch wiki, blah blah car, and hitch gathering. Using these tools not to shift the focus of how they'd hitch, but as offering an invitation to others and to share their experiences. For life is better when shared. As my mother always said, live learn and pass it on. My informants did not hold Rachel Botsman's promise of a shared economy. Sharing was about community and hitchhiking was about the actual world exhilaration of not knowing what would happen. A hitch time time warp. And the many blogs and films and posts of what my informants wanted to share as if to say look I was there became my eyes, as they redefined Marc Auger's non-places. The road to nowhere was its own destination. In his comprehension of center periphery models of space, Auger showed us that declaring a hierarchy of significance came with the sacrifice of people, places and things. The fleeting image of our visually oriented fast-paced times commodified and abstracted our framing of vision. Where was the stop that my mother once spoke of? Without breaks, Kurtzel told us that it was all exponential, 
and we'd have exhausted the resources of fossil fuels and the petrol was running out, but we kept speeding along. And though Rome wasn't built in a day, the Roman Empire became an empire because of its roads. Ask any historian, looking back on a past as if pretending to predict a future. And in our zeitgeist, with the collapse of capitalism, the fall of the Roman Empire still held its legacy, all these years on, of road networks that colonised the land. When I left the colonies and lived in the motherland in Berlin, I focused on the Penan communities of Sarawak for my MA thesis. I returned to the post-logged forests of Borneo to try to sense-make the Penan youth's relationship with the forests of the past and the remnants of all that was left behind. The first blockade was erected in 1987, but it did not stop the monopoly of logging companies, palm oil plantations and the timber mafia from making Taib Maimud a personal wealth of over 15.5 billion US dollars over the 33 years that he was the chief minister of Sarawak. The blockades did not stop 96% of the 130 million year old tropical hardwood forest from being turned into disposable chopsticks in Japan, as if disposable in our disposable age. And with only 200 individuals still living the nomadic ways, the other 6,000 Penan were settled in government village settlements. The secondary forest growth moated the settlements with logging roads, stitching a rich tapestry of exposed clay bed soil veins on the blanket of green. Out in the field, I observed that hunting was the primary engagement of the Penan youth in the forest, with the return of the animals as their greatest symbol of hope. But it was harder to hunt than it used to be. Post-logging, with only memories of the grand height of high-top canopies to coordinate a distribution of UV nutrition, the trees were spindly and filled with forest floor thicket of vines and slippery clay bed soil erosion. So it was hard to hunt, no longer able to rely on the blowpipe that could shoot through the space of primary forest. Now Penan hunters relied on their guns and their motorbikes to carry them from the government village settlements to faraway lands in search of a symbol of hope. My MA supervisor was the great Dr. Mark Curran, who'd inspire me with his wise words and embodied physicalization as if miming a game of charades. He'd speak of studying up, always heralding Laura Nader's methodology of researching the invisibilities of power structures. And in our game of master apprentice, his hand would mimic a camera lens held up to his eye, embodying that there exists a whole off-camera world beyond the frame. But we choose where we directed our focus, and we could look up, and his telescope hand framing his eye, and the class following what he wanted us to see, would look up, for optimism is a strategy. My dear supervisor introduced me to his dear Nikolai Mertsov, who had his own way of visualising the Anthropocene. And Mertzoff offered a toolkit of a method he called counter-visuality. In tracking visual imperialism from its militaristic origins to the present reality of the market, Mertzoff surmised that to counter capitalism required a rupture of its form. If capitalism was a linear story, an anti-capitalist rupture was a fractured narrative. I swapped ecosystems from an economic one of abstraction and commodification to an ecological one of an interconnected world, of an interconnected web. Follow one element as a linear story and it's still commodified on its single path. But explore an element's interdependent relationships and an ecology is made visible 
deciphering that there is more than point A and point B and the path that connects them. It's all connected. When the elders spoke of Sahal, those good old days before the logging came, there used to be a network of Jalangam, the footpaths. Nomadic family groups would follow in the footsteps of forest floor paths and leave messages for each other. The Penan may have been an oral culture who understood the caution of words, but they had a complex system of communication through small arrangements of twigs and leaves sculpted and left on the footpaths to bear messages to those who would walk on by. These sculpted arrangements translated as oro to find a sustainable practice to forest foraging, deciphering messages such as there is no more sago palms in this area or we have caught five boars and our family invites others to come feast or ayao, an enemy is close and an enemy was close and the ayao of logging companies cleared 96% of the forest and cleared the footpath networks and only the memories of the elders were left to word a trace of the past. Mertzoff heralded Claude Monet's painting Unloading Coal as one of the first visualizations of the Anthropocene. Watching masses of individuals reduced to identityless workers as silhouettes of robotic procession of smog-stained skies of French industrialization. The impression must have been from a window of a steam train, an impression of freeze frame from the chug 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 perspective. But now progress made the image move with modernity from grain to pixel and with a camera to help me sense make the senseless. I'd lakao tai toro, go hunting with my Penan hunter informants. Along the logging road we searched for a symbol of hope, but the hunt was as quick as a bang of a gunshot, and then it was just the long ride home on our motorbikes. Holding my Penan informants tight on the back of a motorbike, I journey on those logging roads and look to the side to a relationship that motored their lives. My subject of the forest, caught as a frame, frozen, an image, a whole ecosystem, commodified and abstracted. I call it motion blur. It's all a blur on the paths of progress. Before I called stop, before my mother passed, she bought me driving lessons. I knew how to be the passenger, but driving was a chaotic frenzy of scanning mirrors, finding blind spots, oncoming traffic, eyes darting, flashes of reflection, and all the while watching my speed as I sped along. I may have since made the anthropocentric ecologies of my peripheral vision, but this was as a passenger. Taking control of the wheels of progress, I could barely even focus on all the other cars and the other people, let alone have self-awareness or predict what lay ahead. Rolling into some contingent future, I don't know if I will pursue learning to drive or if I will brand myself as a permanent passenger whilst self-driving cars turn us all into passengers. For now, I'm just being kind to myself. In the aftermath of my mother's passing, I'm just trying to sense make the senseless, finding the simplicity of a simple life in an interconnected world, relearning the art of living on a damaged planet and just going on lots of walks, slow paced and measured because let's face it, this passenger of life can't ride in cars too long. I still get motion sickness.